Uh, and today we're going to be talking about extending Argo CD with health checks and resource actions. These fall under the umbrella of resource customizations. Christian, during the cargo talk, if you're here for that, said his talk was an advanced one. This one is not an advanced one. It's a relatively straightforward and basic one. Originally, this was a lightning talk, 10 minutes, but I got asked to kind of blow it out to 25 because uh, one of the presenters had some visa issues and I was like, oh, okay, no problem, I can fill some time. So in terms of the structure of this talk, I'm really kind of following the four W's and an H. What are these things? Why do you want to do these things? How do you do these things? Who should care about this stuff? And where can you do it uh, upstream? Now, some background, as I mentioned, I'm with Red Hat. We have a Kubernetes distribution called OpenShift. If you're not familiar with it, it is extremely operator heavy, right? Like we have operators up the yin yang. You want to manage nodes in OpenShift, an operator does that for you. You want to manage authentication in OpenShift, an operator does that for you. Which means that this talk is really important for that and is why I'm passionate about it because you really need to have these health checks and resource actions to allow your users to manage those operators effectively. So if you're not familiar with health checks in Argo CD, what that does is essentially validates the health of your resource. Is your resource healthy? Is it suspended? Is it degraded? Is it a bunch of other statuses? Uh, the resource action, what it does is it allows the user to interact with the resource in an easy way, right? And there's a variety of reasons why you want to do that, and we'll get to that in a second. But in terms of the what, one thing I kind of added to this presentation when it kind of expanded is, one of the things that Argo does is it will take the health check from a resource and then it aggregates all of that upwards into the application. And it does that by looking at essentially an order of precedence or priority of the resource health checks and going to the one that's worse. And I always kind of thought, well, I know degraded is probably the worst, but I never really understood what the order actually was. And I go look at the Argo CD docs and there's no documentation what that order actually is. You got to go dig into the source code to find it. So here's what the order is. So you know, unknown is actually surprisingly the worst health status and will the one always be picked of any resources in that, then degraded, then missing, then progressing, then suspended, then healthy as the, uh, the last resource. If you look here on the right, you can see the canary one. Whoops, sorry, go back. You can see the canary one has a heart, which indicates that it's healthy. The blue green has a little pause symbol in it, which you can really squint, you can see it, which indicates it's suspended. And then the last one, the network policy, there's no health check at all, right? Because there's no symbol. So why do you want to do health checks? Are all my applications and resources healthy? You can ask the magic eight ball, but it probably won't give you a good answer, right? Really what you want to do is you want to observe the application in order to understand whether it's healthy or not, and that's really where this health check's into play. Another metaphor for this that I kind of like is if people are familiar with Schrodinger's cat, everybody kind of knows that, the cat, is it alive or is it dead? You don't really know until you look at it, right? And it's the same thing with your application. Is it alive or it's dead? You don't know until something observes it. And unlike the cat, though, your application can come back to life, right? So you need to monitor that status. So again, for the why, it allows Argo to understand the health of a resource. And this is really critical when you're deploying custom resource definitions, operators, things like that, that Kubernetes has no understanding about in terms of what this thing is and what it does. The other one that you'll often see people ask questions about on the CNCF Argo CD Slack forums is, I'm doing a sync wave and it's not working. It's just skipping the resource and going to the next one. Nine times out of 10, it's because that is a custom resource or something that doesn't have a health check. Argo knows nothing about it, so it just deploys it and from that point forward, Argo can it to be healthy. Right? You need to write a health check for it in order for that sync wave to actually work. And the um, other one, as I mentioned, is it's aggregated. Now, I'm here trying to sell you on health checks and the importance of creating custom health checks. And Billy Mays, if folks are familiar with him from the early 2000s, was very familiar for selling infomercial products on TV. And he always goes, you know, buy this product, it's $9.99, but wait, there's more. And then he would try to sell you something else as part of the package, right? So for me, one of the big reasons why you want to do health checks is if you're already monitoring Argo CD in terms of the application status, is it degraded, is it spending, adding health checks to your resources gets you monitoring for those resources for free, right? So I got a custom resource that normally Kubernetes knows nothing about, there's no service monitoring, nobody knows what the status is, but I add a custom health check for it in Argo, and in Argo, if it gets reported as degraded, that will filter up to the application and I will see that in my monitoring, right? So I essentially get free monitoring for those resources simply by building this custom resource check. So I wrote two common use cases here for custom health checks that I can think of. The default health check doesn't do what I want. 
So there's various scenarios for that. The classic example, and I got a bit of a demo for it, is you have persistent volume claims that support late binding, and they'll be stuck and progressing until something binds to it. But if you do things like Argo workflows or Tecton, nothing binds to it until you actually run a pipeline, right? And that essentially hangs up your whole application. Um, new versions or bugs cause the out-of-the-box health checks to behave differently. So I've got this problem, and I got a demo for it as well in OpenShift where they've done a change to something, there's a bug in it, and now all of my operators are reporting degraded because of that bug, and I had to create an overwritten health check to fix that. And the one I like to rant a little bit about is that the health check was out of the box, but for some reason somebody upstream decided to remove it, and I'm looking at you, application object. So anybody who's done app of app, in 1.8, they removed the application health check object. That really burned my britches, to use an expression, because it was like there was no good reason, in my opinion, for removing it. But now I've got to go back and add this thing every time I want to use app of app, right? And then the last one is the obvious one, managing custom resources. You deploy like Cert Manager or something else in your cluster that has a custom resource definition, requires you to create custom resources. Kubernetes knows nothing about it. Yes, it knows your pods, your deployments, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, but your custom resources, it knows nothing about, and that's really where a custom health check comes into play. Now, on the resource action side of the house, you know, many of these resources, well, let me, let me back up for a second. Let me ask a question. How many people here know with an Argo application, you can add an annotation to it to do a refresh? Only a couple of people do. Okay. How many people know what that annotation is off the top of their head? Yeah, same with me. I'm always Googling it, right? So basically, as I'm saying here, a lot of these resources have these kind of annotations where you can put an annotation on a resource and it will drive some behavior, or you can do something with it to drive some behavior. And the user is trying to remember that. Yeah, it's difficult or impossible, but instead, in Argo CD, you can create this resource action and it will appear up in that little pop-up menu there on the right, and your users can access it without necessarily having to Google or figure out what is that annotation again, right? It also aids discovery because unless somebody bothers to look up the annotation, they may not even know that capability is there. Cert Manager, another classic one, like maybe I need to refresh my certificate. How do I do that, right? There's an annotation for that. Uh, but unless you are aware of that, you would never know and you'd struggle to get, make that happen. The other thing is it can provide additional capabilities. So when you're re working with custom resources, um, there may be other things that you want people to be able to do with them. And you can add a resource action to support that. And maybe another question for the audience. How many people here have their application teams using Argo CD as the way they manage their apps or clusters, like their view into Kubernetes? Yeah, a few. That's very common. So this is really useful for teams that manage your applications from the Argo CD UI, right? Because you're giving them the capability to do things in that UI that they use day-to-day -to, -day to manage their applications. All right, so how to do this. Your resource, custom resource checks our resource actions and health checks are written in Lua, which is a programming language. Uh, it's added as a resource customization in the config map Argo CD CM, which we'll get to in a little more detail in a second. And your resource customizations that you place in Argo CD CM, that config map, overrides the default ones, right? So it always takes precedence over what the default ones are. And people sometimes get a bit uh, put off. Okay, I gotta write some code, I gotta write some Lua. And as I like to say, if you can write a bash script, you can write a Lua script. Anybody know where that guy's from? Dodgeball. dodgeball, that's right. If you can throw a wrench, you can, or you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. I was gonna bring a wrench and throw it into the audience, but the CNCF committee told me that technically that would violate the good conduct rule, so I guess I didn't do that. All right, so to define the health checks and custom resources in Argo uh, CM, the health check is basically resource customizations, health, and then the group underscore kind. If it's a core API and there's no group, you can just do the underscore kind, and the resource action follows the same practice except it's actions instead of health. Very straightforward. So in terms of the how, how do you create a custom health check? So a health check can access all of the fields on the object that you're checking. So you can use Lua to check the status. You can check other fields in spec, for example, or metadata if you need to. And what you want to do in that Lua script is you want to return a health status object back to Argo C, and it consists of two things. One is the status, so is this help app healthy? Is it progressing? Is it degraded? And the other one is a message, right? And that can provide additional information to the user in terms of what's happening if there's a problem. In my opinion, best practice, always provide a meaningful message when if you're returning a status other than healthy. Nothing is more annoying than a user to see, hey, this is degraded, and there is nothing, 
right? Okay, let me go splunking through the status block to see what's going on with this thing. Uh, you can develop your health checks locally and iteratively. So uh, in kubectl, the first step to doing this is basically getting a copy of the Argo CD config map. Um, if you want users to be able to develop, develop their own health checks, you can give them a skeleton, like they don't necessarily have to have access to the production version of it. Um, then what you want to do is you want to get the resource that you're going to check. So in this case, I've got a subscription in OpenShift, which is a custom resource that we have for managing operators. And that one has a problem, so I'm going to output that to YAML and save it as a file. And then the last thing you can do, it, you want to do is you want to run the Argo CD command line. And you can actually say, okay, Argo CD, run this command. And what I want you to do is to look at my uh, subscription, my bad sub.yaml, and run it against the Argo CD CM that I'm providing. And in there, I'll have my custom health check, and it will output what the status is. So if you ever try to write your own health check and you're doing it directly in a cluster, it's pretty painful to be constantly trying to update the config map and then test your thing in the cluster, whereas this allows you to kind of mock things up and try different scenarios and understand what's going on a lot better, right? All right, so we'll do a demo here. Now, I'm well known for fat fingering things, so we'll see how I do here with this. And I'm also well known for my really poor trackpad skills. So let's take a, uh, the classic example. We have a persistent volume that has late binding on it. Uh, is that big enough? Let me make that a little bigger. There's a, I see there's a few older people in the audience like me that can't see. Yeah, so you can see here the phase is set to pending, right? And if we run that against the default health check, and I've got a script that I wrote here, because like I just said, I am terrible with fat fingering. You're already witnessing my poor trackpad skills too with this mouse pad. If we do the uh, late bind, Default, oops, sorry, let me change directories, that would be helpful. You can see that it's coming out as the status is progressing, right? Which is bad in many cases when you have a late binding uh, storage driver. On the other hand, what I've done is in the Argo CDCM, I've added a persistent volume claim here where I'm actually checking what the status is. And if it's in the pending state, I'm overriding it and saying, you know what, just return healthy. It's not progressing because I don't want my application to be clogged up waiting for a binding that's never going to happen or is going to happen infrequently. And if we run the, uh, the script against that one, uh, late binding. You can see here it comes up healthy, right? And the only thing that's different between that script is I'm going against the newer Argo CD CM where I added that health check, right? So that's how easy it is to develop these things. Same with the, uh, to throw a little shade on my employer because hopefully they won't fire me for it. But uh, as I mentioned, there is a bug in subscription objects in OpenShift that was recently introduced. And it really only happens when you restart clusters. Unfortunately for me, I have a home lab environment where every day I'm starting it in the morning and I'm shutting it down at night because it also doubles as my gaming machine. So uh, I hit this thing all the time and it was driving me nuts because all of my operators would come up as degraded. And the bug essentially that you see this resolution failed problem here, right? The out of the box health check that is in Argo CD will essentially consider the subscription to be degraded if it has this health check status. And the reason why this is happening is because there is a bug where the operator is not clearing this like it should be, right? And it's actually gonna be fixed in the next, uh, next uh, Z release of OpenShift. But again, if I uh, do my health checks here and I'll do a bad, oh, let me get out of this directory and go back to sub. Uh, and we do the bad sub default. You can see this is coming across as degraded down here, right? And again, if I update my health check, I'll just go get the one I did here for the subscription. All I did here, and this is a little, maybe a little complicated, Luba, but really it's not that bad, is I'm just ba basically, as soon as I see that the status looks okay on the first condition of the array of conditions, I'm just breaking out and not checking anything else in order to get it to return healthy. And if I run that one, I do uh, bad sub updated, you can see it comes back healthy, right? 
So there's just a couple of use cases where uh, having health checks is really useful and having the ability to create them adds a lot of value to a deployment of Argo CD. So we'll continue on here with the slides and then we'll come back to a demo in a second. Let's see how I'm doing on time, but pretty good. All right, so resource actions are the next thing. So actions are surfaced in the user interface via the, the resource menu or the kebab menu on each uh, resource. Everybody familiar with the kebab term? Okay, just check in. Uh, it also is available through the Argo CD CLI. You can actually run actions directly through the Argo CD CLI. It's composed of two parts. You have a discovery part here, which is essentially returning the list of actions that that is applicable. Whoops, I forgot I can't highlight things here. It's applicable to that resource. And then you get the actual definition. So under the definitions, you have a definition for every action that you define and it does something, right? So in this case here for external secret, for example, what it does is it will force that external secret to be do a resync. And as I mentioned earlier, you know about annotations, would I remember what the force sync is off the top of my head, annotation? No, right, this makes it easy. So uh, the discovery.lua gets executed when you actually click the kebab menu. It does not get executed all the time. So it's not like a performance sync or anything from that point of view. And the action definition, as I mentioned, is what actually gets executed when they select a particular action on that object. As a best practice, I highly recommend setting the enabled disabled states of the actions based on the status of the object, right? Not all actions are gonna be applicable at all times. Don't make the user click it, nothing happens, and they're scratching their head wondering what's going on, right? Just to disable the action from the get-go. But you can see here, this is a very small amount of Lua, right? This is not a lot of code. And again, most people who can do bash can handle that no problem at all. Uh, so when you're using a resource action to mutate an object, like add an annotation or something to it, uh, that's perfectly fine, but be aware if you do other kind of mutations, it might actually conflict with what's in Git, right? Argo might go, whoa, I just modified something in that object with this resource action. Now it's no longer in sync, what do I do? The other thing to be aware of with resource actions that is cool, but it's a double-edged sword, is you can actually create brand new resources in a resource action. I really don't recommend this, generally speaking. It should only really be used, in my opinion, with ephemeral objects. So if you want to create like a one-off job from a cron job as a resource action, that's fine. In Tecton, which is something I'm not familiar with, which is a CI tool, we would create a pipeline run, which is essentially one run of a pipeline. And that's ephemeral and that's fine too. Those kind of use cases, but you shouldn't be creating permanent things because that again should be in Git and managed by Git ops, not something that's created by people pressing a menu, right? We don't want to do click ops. All right, so from a demo perspective, So in OpenShift, we have a operator um, called the compliance operator. It basically makes sure that your cluster is in compliance with PIS, or PCI, CIS, I'll get that right eventually, uh, benchmarks that are out there, right? And it will test all that for you. One of the things that it can do with the compliance scan object is it can actually uh, rescan. You can add an annotation to it and rescan. So here I've got my discovery Lua where I'm basically saying, you know, if that object status isn't nil, and the status of that is done, i.e. it's already done a scan, it's not in the middle of doing a scan, enable this action, which I'm doing down here. And then from a definition point of view, this is really straightforward. Checking to see if there's any annotations, if not, empty, add an empty annotation block and then add that annotation to actually do that rescan, right? So if I go to my OpenShift environment here, and you don't have to be an OpenShift person to understand this, but uh, what happened there? Hang on, let me F5 it. I think it's just because I woke up from this. Whoops. There we go. So I've got my compliance scan objects here. You can see they're all in done. And if I go to this object in Argo CD, hang on. Again, suspend, let me re-sign in. There we go. Find the compliance object. And go down. Yeah, you see the compliance scan object here, this OCP4 CIS lab, click that. There's my rescan, go ahead and click that. Yep, I wanna execute that action. And if I go back to OpenShift, you can see now that it's running that scan again, right? I didn't need to, as a user, I didn't need to remember that annotation. I could just go ahead and do it. And it makes operating things much more easy and simple. So that was a very simple and straightforward demo as I'm getting near the end on time here. So who should be doing this stuff? If you are somebody, anybody here writing operators, by the way? 
finish. Just, just ask that. Oh, one guy, okay. So if you're writing an operator and you have custom resource definitions, which you almost always do with an operator, you should be providing health checks. Please don't make me troll through your operator code to figure out what all the status is. If you look at that condition block, the standard condition block in Kubernetes with different op operators, it can be really difficult to figure out what is unhealthy for this. The other thing with operators that's interesting, and you probably may have run into this, is they often have edge cases that are hard to discern unless you actually hit that issue. So it's really nice when the person who wrote the operator understands the design, understands the status of things, writes the health check for it. The other benefit of that is that you increase user satisfaction of your operator and you increase adoption of your project. Nobody gets frustrated to try to deploy this in a GitOps way because there's no health check associated with it. For platform teams, same idea. You may be deploying things into the platform that don't have a default resource check. Don't make your users do it. You should provide that as part of the out-of-the-box platform experience. And same as with the operator team, you're increasing user satisfaction and adoption of your platform. And at the end, everybody. I mean, if you have a problem with a resource that doesn't have a health check, and it's returning erroneous or inappropriate uh, information, go ahead and add that uh, custom health check. So Argo CD includes a number of health checks and resource actions out of the box. There's a link to where you can find them in the GitHub repo. If you're looking for examples of how to do it, you will find no better place to go for those examples. The other interesting one is if you're wondering, and this comes up sometimes in the, on Slack as well, where's the default health checks for deployments, jobs, the core Kubernetes APIs? They're not in the, uh, that folder, which is all Lua code. Those were actually written in Golang, and they're part of the GitOps engine at that, uh, that point. So if you want to see what's the behavior of a core API, because you're looking at overriding it, or a core health check, that's where you'd go to see it. If you want to contribute health checks, there's a nice contrib contribution guide on how to do it, but it's essentially just writing a health check, doing a PR in that folder I showed you before, this, uh, this first one submitting it along with your test cases and you're off to the races and getting in. Again, if you're writing operators for public consumption, you should be doing this. And honestly, as again, kind of mini rant at Red Hat, I'm kind of fighting this battle a little bit, trying to convince all the Red Hat operator teams that they need to start doing this, right? Now that we're fully supporting Argo CD. All right, so that brings me to the end of the presentation. Right, do I have time for questions? Okay, so we got a few minutes for questions. Uh, any? Great presentation. So a uh, question about uh, the resource actions. Um, you said the user could click there and do clicky clicky stuff. Uh, do you allow users to input something? For example, if I have to do an annotation where some string part of it should come from the user. You know, that's a good question. I have never had to do it, so I've never okay. really thought about it. Right. But I'll tell you what, let me uh, do a quick check. I, I want to say no. Yeah. But I don't want to say no without knowing for sure. Right. Yeah. So let me have a look. But I don't remember seeing anything in the documentation about it. Okay. But having said that, um, Lua has a number of libraries, and I don't know if there's some way to do it. But I would suspect mm -hmm. no is the answer because the inter the resource action actually executes in the back end. Mm -hmm. So unless it's, you do something magical in discovery, I'm not sure how you would make that work. Okay. So I think it's no, but I can, I'll double check. All right. Okay. Thank you. That was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, I see Michael Crenshaw is here. He can answer that right away. Yeah, uh, ah, thank you, Michael. We're probably going to need a different interpreter for that, so it's probably going to add that. Is there plans to support something else besides Lua? Like, for example, if the default hull checks are in Go, is there a plan to support it in Go, for example? I don't know the answer to that, but again, it might, since Michael's sitting right there, I'll take advantage of him and pick on him. Uh, probably not. I think Lewis seems to cover the use cases that we're concerned with. Uh, there are a few like core resources that are implemented in Golang for reasons that predate my knowledge of Argo CD as a project. Uh, so yeah, as far as I know, we're sticking with just Lua for custom. Yeah, so uh, why just Lua? I mean, why not use Vasm or something like everybody's crazy about Vasm? Well, I'm sure Michael can <laughs> shed more light on that, but <laughs> I'll give you my two cents. There's, okay. there's also the, so having options okay. means more work for maintainers, okay. right? right. Uh, Lua is not a complicated programming language. It's very straightforward. There's a number of other products that use Lua as an extension mechanism, so it's very popular in that space. 
So from my point of view, it's like, yeah, you could add more staff, but you're making more work for everybody that could probably be better spent on other things. Okay. Yeah, Michael got, gave me the thumbs up, so. 